This is part two of Stephen Frank's memoirs of growing up in the small fishing town of Dill, Kent in the 1960s. It is his own memory and it is not to be seen as detrimental or negative viewpoints to anyone that knew him. This is his reflections. Laying in bed listening to the sea on the shingle beach was a great way to induce sleep, a sound which is clearly in my ears to this day, even though I am not close to the sea now. Our house was just over a hundred yards from the beach, and on foggy nights, which were many, the sound of the foghorns going periodically made it very atmospheric. These foghorns were relayed from the light ships, which were anchored around the treacherous Goodwin Sands. Incidentally, these light ships did not have an engine, and were towed out and anchored at their location, but they were manned. The crews had to have strong stomach to stay aboard them. Unfortunately, all have gone now, and have been replaced by modern technology. Winifred Franks, my paternal grandmother, used to put an old conch shell near to my ear. I could hear the sea rushing around inside it. A great sensation. She was right. These were happy distant days. The winter of 1963 was awful and seemed to go on forever. Large areas of the sea froze. The temperature was below zero. The skies were heavy with snow and the wind was gale forced easterly for days, a proper winter. Me, my uncle Peter and some friends ventured out onto the seafront to fly my box kite. I remember it being brown with what appeared to be lots of string and wooden strips. A very complex kite for a youngster, but it did fly and went straight over the houses at the top of Farrier Street and I'm still waiting for it to come down today. Winters were great in the 1960s as you opened the door in the morning the snow fell in. That meant no school. It was such fun to play in the snow. Snowball fights were great, but you had to be a good shot and ducker. We used to watch people skiing along the high street and cars and vans skidding. It must have been a nightmare for those adults. But that didn't bother us. I used to go around my grandmother's and clear the snow from her front step and put salt on the path. It was always worth a tanner. After all that fun, it was a hot cup of tea and a huffkin with plenty of butter and girls' honey on it. The huffkin was the local name for a large white roll. Such happy days, now long since past. The summers, which always appeared to be long, hot and dry, every year in the 1960s, were full of fun. Don Franks, my father, bought me a cod line. I could always scrounge half a score of lugworm from either Terry Frank's shop or from Tony Heath's The Angler's Den and go on the beach to practice my throwing. That was hard work. I used to have it spinning above my head like a sling, but I never caught anything on the beach. It was better to go onto the pier and drop it down over the edge. There was always plenty of starfish, crabs and the odd place or two of a reasonable size, and not forgetting the Wilkes. I remember going out for days fishing with my dad, Tony Heath and my cousin Robert Franks, in one of the great fishing boats. It was called the If Not or Why Not, these boats were seen as one of the best on the beach. It was such a treat. It was skippered by a guy called Taffy. Jimmy Ickman was his real name. Such a character. It was always a good sensation as the boat was launched down the steep shingle beach on, a, on the greasy planks into the sea. The smell of tar and diesel from the engine combined with the briny sea was a heady mixture then. What a day. I remember catching the heaviest cod of the day when we came across a shoal of black bream opposite Sandown Castle. Robert, my cousin, was seasick as they started gutting the fish. Great memories of days gone by. Summer meant Knickerbocker glories at the great ice cream parlour opposite the pier. The parlour is still there and until recently the decor was exactly the same as it was in the 1960s, which felt quite strange but good. The ice cream was wonderful. Strawberry and vanilla was mixed in true Italian style. It was such a treat to go in and have a Knickerbocker glory. A small one was two shillings and a large one was two and sixpence. Not forgetting a drink of Horlicks, served in a Horlicks mug with a name on it, and a solid handle, pure indulgence. I remember when there was a nationwide competition held to see what was deemed as the best ice cream in Britain. Dill Beach Parlour came second, I think Ross Ice Creams came first. Airedale Terriers appeared to be very popular when I was young. I recall my maternal grandfather, Charles Boot, telling me the story of, of his wire-haired Jack Russell, cross terrier called Mick, who used to get into scraps with the Star and Garter Landlord's Airedale at the top of Oak Street. 
which was a few doors up from where my grandfather and grandmother lived at the time. Incidentally, the Airedale always won, only the pride was a little damaged on Mick's side. Interestingly, Mick used to stop the bus at the bottom of Oak Street by the Town Hall and get on the bus. The conductors all knew him. What a treat to have a bus with a conductor on. The bus stopped on King Edward Road, where they would let Mick off. He would go and visit my great auntie Joan Mitchell, my maternal grandmother's sister, long departed now, and after refreshments he would get on the bus and disembark at Seath's the fishmongers and game shop and return back home. One clever Jack Russell. Seath's shop on the high street was a very interesting shop. It had an open front and all the fish was on display on marble slabs. They also sold game, depending on the season, from pheasants and hares to unplucked turkeys which hung up on hooks from the ceiling. That was always wondrous to me, certainly a good example of bygone times before supermarkets. One of the highlights in the dual calendar in those days was the carnival and forest funfair. In my younger days this was located along the seafront from the Royal Hotel to the top of North Street. I recall being told about the young man who was on the rotating swings. These involved little individual chairs attached by a chain to the ceiling of a ride and it would go round faster and faster until the chairs would swing out over the beach. On this one occasion the chain broke and the chair, chain and man ended up in the sea. Nobody was hurt luckily, just got a little wet. I often wondered what happened to that man. The carnival was such a special sight, with the Royal Marines brass band playing so loud that I had to cover my ears. Reflecting back on the funfair, it was very traditional, with the galloping horses and steam powered organ, lots of stalls, the rifle ranges, bumper cars, a ghost train, candy floss and hot dogs, all surrounded by caravans. Such smells, the noise and atmosphere from now bygone times, all for sixpence or a shilling a go. Well I think that's a good note to end on. I have many memoirs I would like to share with you at a later date. I do thank Dave Scarden and this excellent editing and enthusiasm in keeping past history of Dill Kent alive, which makes this all possible and a reality. But also to all the people whom I have mentioned. A lot now have sadly passed the bar. But these stories are my summer day reflections as I saw them through the eyes of a young boy growing up in the 1960s in Deal. I hope you enjoyed them. Stephen Franks